This portion of CardioSource video news coverage of TCT 2010 is brought to you by Medtronic. Welcome to CardioSource Video News. I'm Dr. Randy Martin. Now there's been a lot going on at TCT Conference 2010, and to help us understand the major developments, I'm happy to be joined by two very prominent colleagues. Dr. Peter Block is Professor of Medicine and Director of the Structural Heart Program at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, and Dr. Spencer King is President of the St. Joseph's Heart and Vascular Institute in Atlanta. Peter Spencer, I'm glad to have both of you here, and you are very prominent. Uh, <laughs> oh, absolutely. So no Spencer, question about it. <laughs> that's what you told me. <laughs> Spencer, you know, let me start with you. What, do you what's, what are some major developments that you've uh, seen today? You know, the, the Syntex trial, it was uh, very pivotal. It, it changed things uh, for us in, in guidelines with left main, but it was only a one-year follow-up that was published last year. Now we have a three-year follow-up, which is uh, everybody's waiting for the longer term. And uh, so it looks interesting. There's some uh, divergence. Uh, everybody pretty much knows that the high syntax score, that is the more complex patients, didn't do as well as the simpler patients. They've looked at the left main group at three years compared to one year. You say, okay, you make it through one year, that's fine, but what about longer term? Turns out that left main group's holding. Okay. It, it looks good. It's comparable to surgery at three years. There's not uh, any uh, signal right there. Now. Within that, of course, the ones the more complex, that uh, group of patients with a high syntax score did not do as well, but overall it's okay. The triple vessel patients, on the other hand, now at three years, the curves are widening a bit, and the surgery patients now have a significantly better survival at three years mm. in that triple vessel group. So the bottom line lesson, I think, from syntax longer term follow-up is what we have begun to anticipate. The, the uh, more complex and difficult patients requiring four, five, six, seven stents uh, probably are better for surgery at this moment. On the other hand, left main disease, particularly in patients at high surgical risk, are doing it quite nicely Peter, and it's still holding. Uh, I'm, I'm going to argue with Spencer a little okay. bit on this one because I think the left mains are more complicated than that, not quite so straightforward. If you have bifurcation disease in the left main and distal disease, it gets to be a real tricky wicket for interventionalists. Uh, I think the good news about the left mains is that the main stem of the left main is probably interventional territory, and that's a good thing to do. But as far as the multivessel stuff that's way distal, plus a left main and a complicated bifurcation lesion, we'll see how that comes out when they look at the subgroups, but I'm not confident that's going to be quite as good as it may appear at the first blush. Yeah, you're that's absolutely right. right. Those are the high syntax score right. people, right. and within that, there are some that are technically more challenging. But you're absolutely right. It's yeah. the left main that's uh, reasonably isolated or maybe only one other vessel involved. Those are doing extremely well. And okay. the other, there's another thing about syntax. Just okay. uh, how much stent did the patients in syntax get? And they got, you know, sort of a, a railroad track worth of stents okay. if they had multiple vessel disease. And consequently, it's the patient that needs a shorter stent and less disease that probably is going to be the interventionalist dream for this one, and that's a good news uh, issue for the interventionalist and for patients, I think. Well, you know, we'll come, we can come back to that. Right. Peter, you know, the partner trial is obviously a big one. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the partner trial, Randy, is probably the landmark trial in structural heart disease, period, and arguably maybe even the most important trial in interventional cardiology the last 10 years, though I'm not going to argue that, but certainly important. Uh, non surgical candidates, mm -hmm. right? Number one, most important, non-surgical candidates only, randomized to ongoing medical therapy or to transcatheter valve implantation, mm -hmm. TAVI. And we expected and hoped for a 15% difference, and what we got was a 20% difference. Mm -hmm. In one year, the mortality of the medically treated plus balloon valvuloplasty patients, 50.7% versus 30.7% in the TAVI patients. Right. So a huge difference. Big difference. And sort of a home run for the uh, TAVI group. And the good news is that even if you look at combination outcomes, mortality plus hospitalization one year, it still comes out way ahead for the TAVI patients. New York Heart Association class, as expected, right. way ahead for the TAVI patients. And they don't seem to have any deterioration in valve function, which is extraordinary. 
the amount of aortic regurgitation power yeah, rather leak, whatever it is, yeah. it doesn't seem to change over the first year by echo, and this is core lab right. criteria. So all of that's good news, and I think uh, we have to say that this is going to be the way we treat non-surgical patients. We have to see about the surgical patients next year. Did the, did the non-surgical patients also have, I mean, was one of the randomization balloon valvuloplasty? Was no, that it's conventional just therapy? some of them, most of them, 83% of them got balloon valvuloplasty because there isn't anything else you can do right, for your right. I think right. that's the other lesson here. Right. Balloon valvuloplasty doesn't work. I mean, it, it, it works very poorly. Here you had... 83% got balloon valvuloplasty, and 50% of them were dead in a year. Yeah. Right. So that's so that's that's yeah. not conventional. That's not conventional. Well, you know, how many times do we have to learn this? You know, in 1988 and in 1991, we had the National Heart and Lung Registries and the same Mansfield thing. Registry, which showed exactly, exactly the same right. thing, right? And now we have to show the same thing yet again. I mean, sooner or later, we're going to have to say, guys, balloon valvuloplasty doesn't work very well. Okay, I, well, need, you hold, I need you to hold that thought. We'll come, we'll come right back. We're going to take a short break, and we will be right back. Medtronic proudly introduces Integrity BMS, now available in the U.S., Visit MedtronicStents.com for more information. This is CardioSource video news coverage of TCT 2010. Welcome back to our discussion on today's developments at the TCT Conference 2010. Spencer, I cut you off, so what were you going to say? Uh, I was going to ask Peter a, a question. Peter, you said that this is the most important trial in 10 years in interventional cardiology, and I might agree with you, but is there anything surprising about this trial? And the reason I ask you that is you've taken a group of people who are on death's door. They cannot be operated. They're 83 years old on average. A quarter of them are over 90, I think, or something like that. Uh, and they had severe aortic stenosis, and you fix it. You put a valve in there. Now, the only way this trial could possibly have failed is if the valve was totally ineffective, right. if it didn't work. And it's already been demonstrated to work in 20,000 people around the world. So. Is this analogous <laughs> to having a patient with complete heart block and syncope yeah, and you, a a, you put a pacemaker in and the heart starts beating? Yeah. I mean, is, is this not intuitive? Yeah. And if so, how far do you go with randomized trials of this to prove right. what is blatantly obvious? Well, right. I, I, so, so you have <laughs> you have a brief for a broad yeah. rebuttal. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I was only going to say don't go there about how far do we go. But the fact of the matter is you're right. I mean, we have 20,000 patients in Europe and we know that they do better. And now uh, the FDA is mandating a randomized trial, which we have done, and we've shown once again that aortic stenosis is bad for you. So I'm not quite sure why we continue to do this here in the United States, but the rules are the rules, and we don't really have any choice. And we will do it again, uh, whether we like it or not. But we, I am not surprised by the outcome of this trial. But I am a little surprised by the differential because that's a little bit more so, than I so expected. What, I expected 15 percent. Let me ask you about, uh, and, and do you want to talk about complications that came up in this trial? Well, Did we learn anything with that? Yeah. Let me say one thing about stroke. Okay. That's I mean, no surprise these patients had more hemorrhage and they had more transfusion need because they had an intervention. Right. But the stroke issue is an important one, and it goes back to the syntax business. Yeah, that's what's yeah. The stroke in, in partner for the first 30 days was 6.7%, almost 7% stroke rate. And you can't just brush that aside. That's a critical thing for the patients that have the stroke. And if you look at what happens to those patients that had stroke, their mortality over the first year compared to patients that did not, significantly higher. Right. So the stroke business has to be taken care of. Syntax showed us the surgeons also have stroke, 2 to 3%. And in the past, we said, well, that's sort of the rules of the game. But we need to attack this from the interventional cardiology standpoint and the surgical standpoint and say, guys, we need to be able to take care of these so that people don't have strokes during surgery or during attack. So you're talking about technology needs to exactly. come Exactly. Okay. Technology needs to come to the table and make this better. Well, in the percutaneous valve, there is a technology and maybe many technologies coming along to try to address this. There's a paper, by the way, in next month's uh, Jack Intervention on the a particular gadget that deflects the right. uh, material. If you end up uh, 
cracking up some material that's going right. north, okay. uh, this uh, in the in the aortic arch will send it somewhere else, where it's perhaps not as dangerous. So these kind of things might uh, help us. But that's a sea change. It's a sea change in the way we take care it's of patients. Good, no, it's a good, Every it's a good patient point. going to cardiac surgery then might have to have this if they have a coronary artery bypass graft or a valve. And every patient having a TAVI might have to have this during the procedure. So it's a different way of thinking yeah. about how we take care Remember. of patients. Let okay. me, let me I, I don't want to shift gears, but I do. Um, any other subjects that came up today that sort of caught your eye? Well, uh, you know, I was interested in this new antiplatelet oral agent. Uh, I don't even remember the name of it. Uh, it's in the Lancelot. Ado, yeah. I remember because you can't pronounce it. Adipaxar. I can't pronounce it exactly. Adipaxar. And it's a sort of an interesting uh, safety issue as to whether or not this works. And it turns out it seems to work pretty well. Uh, patients had a little bit of transaminase rise and QT prolongation with a higher doses. So that's a little tricky, but it's a new oral antiplatelet, and it may be something we'll see in the future. They're going to move forward with the trial. Yeah. It's called the Lancelot trial. There are a lot of things. Of course, they're, we're overrun with studies about antiplatelet right. therapy now, and it's a subject after the black box warning on clopidogrel that it's got everybody stirred up. What do you do about genomic uh, right. indication? What do you do about a lot of other things? One of the things in antiplatelet therapy that has struck me is that oral antiplatelet agents are not only subject to genomic variation or whether you've got competitive drugs on board, but are, uh, the absorption of any oral agent it can be a part of the formula. I recently uh, heard a presentation on uh, STEMI patients, patients with acute myocardial infarction taking clopidogrel. Four, hour, uh, four hours later, they had very little antiplatelet effect, not because of metabolism, but the drug simply wasn't absorbed. Absorption. So yeah. this is another part of the formula when we think about uh, high platelet uh, reactivity and how to get at it. Yeah. Well, this is an ACS trial rather than an infarct right. trial. But you yeah. know, in the future, going well, forward, even ACS yeah. patients have a, have a, a, a more different absorption. Yeah. But so you so you're you're excited about where this trial might be going. Well, I don't know if I'm excited or not, but I think it's interesting, and we have to keep our eye on all these new agents because they're going to be part of our armamentarium, whether we like it or not. We have to learn about them. And in the acute intervention, we got to think about uh, intravenous agents again. Uh, as uh, as uh, uh, adjuncts to to our chronic uh, therapy. And uh, quickly, any other any other thoughts about today's meeting? I think those are the high points as far as I'm concerned. Spencer, you have anything? It was a high tech meeting. It gets uh, <laughs> it gets more <laughs> produced and uh, exciting all the time. They announced a, a relationship of uh, the ACC with the, with the uh, a group who put on these uh, very nice meetings. And so I think uh, the future of uh, Education and interventional cardiology is is bright, and I think there's a, a lot that we can do working yeah. together on, on both, sides, both sides of the Atlantic and here in the United States. Well, that's States. great. And Peter and Spencer, I want to thank you, and I want to thank you for joining us. We hope you'll check back with Cardiosource.org for the latest developments at TCT 2010.